James Mangold, acclaimed director of the furiously fast movie Ford v Ferrari, wrote and directed an amazingly intimate and foreboding story about the coming death of the superhero genre, mixing the long-dead cowboy western genre with the ever-popular noir themes provides a commentary that couldn't be achieved if it was written like any other superhero film. In a time where the western has left the limelight and superheroes have taken center stage, Mangold narrates the slow, agonizing death of our favorite heroes before setting the stage for an isolated, yet inspired, generation of youth. Oftentimes, with a video essay, the essayist, which would be me in this scenario, is trying to show how smart they are, most of the concepts and commentary come straight out of their butt, and whenever I write, I try not to do those video essay tropes. I was told very often as a kid that my writing wasn't exceptional, so I'm not about to pretend that it is. Logan is just one of those movies that breeds motivation to be more than our mentors can be, so maybe those emotions are blending in with my writing. Anyway, in this video I'm going to give a brief reminder about what Cinemotive Design is. We'll take a look at the setting and circumstances of Logan, and then we'll quickly look at the reverse trucks before analyzing Logan's Chrysler Limo. I was going to dive a bit more into autonomous vehicles since the auto trucks deliver an important set piece, but I got carried away while writing the script, so I think I'm going to wait and deliver a nicely packaged picture cars video about on-screen autonomous vehicles later. So let's dive in! This is my 19th video in the Picture Car series. I've tried to save time in other videos by giving the refresher premise of, is this the right vehicle for the character? It sums up what Cinemotive Design is, but we haven't had the luxury of going through a case study which was designed by one of the greats in this segment of entertainment. There are a couple out there, Ash Thorpe being one of my favorites. But our master designer for this movie is the legendary Nick Pugh who has a long resume of futuristic concept vehicles that extends to Ad Astra, Oblivion, Star Wars. He even partnered with the MCU for a Tony Stark concept. But what is Cinemotive Design, and why do we need to give it proper credit? Costume design and prop design are some of the most personal elements when creating a character. These foundations of product design set the stage especially in film where the camera can be focused solely on the characters, whereas on stage, the set design is at the forefront of creativity. That's not to say that one is more important than the other in any entertainment medium, but I urge you to consider that how you dress a character also extends to the vehicles they drive. Star Wars was maybe the first good example of vehicle design when it came to their spaceships, especially how their bays open to outer space. Leia's ship doesn't look militaristic, though there are a pair of gunner stations. In fact, it's more representative of a trucker, a carrier of sorts with a series of engines on the back. The design of the Tantive IV took inspiration from earlier transporter vessels like Space 1999's Eagle Transporter. This ship is minuscule in comparison to the large and knife-like appearance of the Star Cruiser, designed to open up at the bottom and engulf its prey. You in the audience, before any people speak a word of dialogue, automatically know who is good and who is evil. It also helps that the opening crawl sort of describes the chase. So how does Nick Pugh's design team develop a vehicle for Logan for the year 2029? Each design challenge comes with its own set of constraints. For example, James Mangold wanted to keep this story as much about Logan as possible. He didn't want any of the future technology to distract the audience away from Logan's story. So when the direction diverts and we get the exposition about Lara's enslavement in Alkali Transigen, we get it through cell phone footage that Logan is watching. There are very few times when the camera is away from Logan's immediate vicinity and that's on purpose. So Nick Pugh needed to design the cars so that they communicated futuristic elements, but those elements were close enough to the present day that they weren't too distracting to the story. Said more clearly by Nick himself, we would present a range of possible directions, and Mangold would usually select the most conservative version. They learned that ultimately this is the most important thing in making a cohesive and believable movie. No matter how cool something appears to be on the surface, if it distracts the audience from the story, it doesn't work in terms of narrative design. Set in the year 2029 and beginning our journey in El Paso, Texas, this western noir adventure takes us down to northern Mexico, up to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and North Dakota before finally crossing into the Canadian border. Crossing the border, back into Logan's home country. I'm Canadian. Coincidence? I think not! 
There are multinational corporations overseeing global food and pharmaceutical production. There are the menacing, faceless businesses that keep the underprivileged in hardworking poverty. There are the security details belonging to competing companies that find themselves the refuse at the bottom of the corporate ladder. And there's also the transportation services that allow those companies to harshly impact every walk of life. In this setting, it has been 25 years since the last known mutant was born biologically. Alkali, one of the many sinister corporations, lets loose the secret that this is due to a biological genome within the world's food supply, suppressing the mutant gene. It's not a hopeful world to live in for a mutant. Beyond that, humans with cybernetic enhancements, known as Reavers, find themselves in the position of being exactly what the legislators of 2000's X-Men feared. While not mutated at the genome level, these cyborgs are the chosen mutation of what humanity can look like. In the early drafts of the script, the limousine was always there. Its Logan's sole means of not only transportation, but income as well. It's how Logan plans on taking Charles Xavier and Caliban out to sea. Well, the jury's out on Caliban, but he's a good guy through and through, and Logan has become more selfless as age besets him, so we'll say he's involved in the plans. Apart from being his income source, it also is a stark callback to his first appearance with the first vehicle we see, an F-Series Ford truck with a bed-mounted camper, a mobile home. A lonely, mobile home. Instead of the young, lone Wolverine driving his single-person camper through the ice and snow, we have our aging James Hallett eschewing the Wolverine name and working gigs as a chauffeur in the hot desert. During the design of the limousine, Lincoln was the brand to lend its influence, the team going so far as generating name ideas. When the partnership with Lincoln fell through, they landed on Chrysler Imperials and Cadillac's aesthetics before realizing that, to keep the project as practical and in budget as possible, the Chrysler 300 base needed to be the initial frame. What results is a mixture of luxury brand coming from America's Big Three, a foreboding future to be sure. With that, FCA signed on as the car company partner. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, let's talk about the bad guys a bit. We'll be quick, since I know the majority of thumbnail clickers want to learn more about the vehicle advertised to them. But I think it's worth mentioning the thought process behind Nick Pugh's design in order for us to appreciate the showstopper. Again, each design begins with a design brief which lists a series of constraints. Mangold's direction for these vehicles was more difficult to realize. The direction was to design a vehicle that didn't look like it came from the military, but looked like it belonged to an intimidating security force made up of cybernetically enhanced Reavers. After FCA signed on as the car company partner, they were able to also provide many of the auxiliary vehicles as well. Many of the antagonist fleet are made up of Jeep and Ram vehicles, only barely recognizable underneath their protective cladding. But additionally, during their brief stay in Oklahoma City, Logan trades in the shot up E8 for an older, to him, 2016 Ram 1500 Rebel. This isn't solely the case, but usually when defining the hero with a certain brand of vehicle, the brand partner goes through great pains to ensure they are only represented as the good guy car. Maybe FCA was hoping that the sole Chrysler would set the brand apart and the audience wouldn't care much about the rest, so on face value, having FCA offer vehicles to both the protagonist and antagonist teams seems pretty odd, but really, much of the Reaver's FCA 4x4s are unmarked and only recognizable when looking for those details. The design team instead gives the leaders of the Reavers, and Munson's hecklers if we're being exhaustive, opposing brands of vehicle. Pierce strolls into the abandoned steel plant in his 28-year-old Ford Excursion, and the Hecklers with a pair of Silverados from 2007 to 2014. You'd think that intimidators from large multi-million dollar corporations, especially a team of technologically enhanced mercenaries, would have more advanced vehicles. But that's enough about bad guys, let's get into the master class of Cinemoto Design, the Chrysler E8 Limousine. Let's begin by going through the timeline of all the limo's designs. With originally the Lincoln brand in mind, Nick Pugh with the coordination of production designer Francois Audouy, who was the designer for 2013's The Wolverine, and also followed Mangold to Ford v Ferrari, the team designed the basic form of the model, taking an inspiration from French limos through the 60s and all the way through the 80s. Real quick, go to both Nick and Francois' websites. They are super thorough when explaining their design processes and provide so much information about the pre-production part of filmmaking that often gets overlooked by the audience. Early design sketches were laid out with the Lincoln brand over the grill placement. 
but once the direction started moving toward Chrysler's Imperial, you could tell more form and crease elements were starting to become more finalized. For example, if you take a look at the front fender's leading line, it's very similar to what Pew's team molded into the Hero car. Talking with Nick, his team really wanted the Imperial brand emblazoned on the limo, but FCA couldn't allow usage of the name or logo. They had either sold the brand image or it had been locked in legal red tape years ago. There was a brief period where the Cadillac emblem was proudly displayed on the grill, and swoop outlines began radiating the bottom shape of current Cadillac grill pieces. To me, this is where the vehicle underwent a soft design freeze. Not a total freeze, obviously, but after this point, no changes were made to the basic form of the vehicle. There's some change that can occur in the light design, but otherwise the body stays the same. And so in my view, the basic design is a mixture of Cadillac and Imperial, just with Chrysler wings instead. And if we take a look at the current design direction of Cadillac, Hughes' team came very close during their parallel development. Tasked with iterating on the current state of design for the brand, Pew innovated rear lights that are very similar to the newly redesigned Escalade. And even further, the newest Cadillac offering, the Lyric, has a basic angle breakdown, a front grille swoop that is mirrored, maybe with a little stretch of the imagination, in Logan's limo. But to be sure, if you compare any of the design elements to a current Chrysler 300, which is the limo base they ended up building from, or even a Lincoln model, you'll spend a lot of time searching before finding anything that that draws a similarity. Even though the design was built on a 300 base, the exterior is a little bit chunkier than a current model. So alongside the bulky exterior body pieces, the designers took further care in developing the wheel dimensions so that the ratios of hub to spoke to rim then tire would be reflected in its imposing stance. I just love the added effort in making sure a Kenda 225-45R18 directional tire was fitted to the wheels. It's the little details that make a great design. These tires wouldn't do very well off-road and likely wouldn't be able to outrun a train, but hey, I'm willing to suspend disbelief on this one. And while automakers can obviously armor-clad really any vehicle they want, a car like this will only be able to withstand the beating it took between the buckshot in El Paso to the standoff in northern Mexico and finally the off-road travel and long haul to Oklahoma City if the automaker has some real experience in developing an armored vehicle. And while limos may seem rare, nearly every major automaker develops a derivative limousine based on a current nameplate. Heck, Hummer even made a limo variant. Based on these two constraints, no real-world example comes closer to a limo tank than the President's Motorcade and the Armored Beast developed by Cadillac, which even further solidifies the notion that this is really a 224 Caddy. Coincidence? I think not! And there are some really nice interior elements that they thought about going with, but in the end, it needed to be less a design showcase and more a normal limo. It's fun to see that they played more extensively with the idea of making it a Chrysler Imperial with interior logos. There's also the standard seating which took inspiration from 60's high-rise furniture, the luxury trim, the halo ceiling lights which match the dash display color. It's not representative of any particular design, but it is familiar to limos of today with some subtle notes of the past and future. Ultimately, the limo came together as a set piece that was equal parts imposing and unassuming and could let Logan bask in his last moments under the sun without distraction. Logan began his on-screen journey at the helm of a lonely Ford 4x4. His journey started long before the bar fight in 2000, but each offering of the character has been augmented by how Logan is paired with a vehicle. The last ride of 2017 began behind the wheel of a vehicle, which forced him in close proximity with others. He continued that journey, driving an enviable Ram 1500 Rebel, but finished once again behind the wheel of an old Ford 4x4. But in the end, he completes his circular cinematic journey, running away from his Canadian home and a family who didn't care for him in his origin. He finds himself now running back across the Canadian border to protect the family he's grown to care for, the only family he has left. This movie was never meant to be about the limo, that's true. Nick Pugh performed his job to perfection when designing an unassuming yet futuristic limousine. Was this the right vehicle for Logan? It got him close to his dream of the ocean, but really, it connected him with Lara. That was its true purpose, and I appreciated the ride along the way. Thank you, Hugh. And thank you all for watching. I'll see you again in the next one.